Hello and welcome to tonight's webinar, where we will discuss the merits of straight-in approaches at non-towered airports. Oh no, I guess actually we're <laughs> Captain Michael Jesh will be presenting a fourth in the series of webinars about the venerable Jeep NS430 and 530 navigators. We'll answer questions posted in the Q&A. If we don't get to your question tonight, then uh, it will be address addressed in a follow-up email. If you want to chat, you can chat amongst yourselves, but we probably won't see your questions there. We'll try. I'll do my best. But tonight, Captain Michael will teach how to perform holding patterns and using the GNS 430 and 530 devices. The uh, Mike is a two-time master instructor who was recently named the 2021 Western Pacific Fast Team Representative of the Year. And if you were to walk one mile for every hour that Mike has spent flying, you could walk from the California coast to Hawaii and back 14 times <laughs> and still have enough left for one trip back to Hawaii. And if you don't want to do that math, it's 25,000 hours. And when he's not out flight instructing in airplanes, uh, GA airplanes, he can be uh, found flying around Southern California in his Cessna 182, where he's been using the 530 uh, for nearly 10 years, probably more than that now. And as a side job, he just flies a Boeing Dreamliner for a major U.S. airline. So, Mike, welcome back. Hi, Brian. I yeah. didn't realize I'd flown that much. I, I, I'd rather, much rather fly to Hawaii than walk. <laughs> I would too. I'm just trying to put it into perspective exactly how much time you've spent in the air. Uh, some might say too much, I suspect. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Brian, for that great introduction. And uh, yeah, let me uh, just get right to it here. My goal tonight, if I can, is, is going to be to try to keep this under an hour, give or take. Uh, I haven't had much luck in the past, so let's see how we do tonight. Uh, so let's just jump right in and uh, stick around, Brian. I, I think we'll have a little opportunity for some more chatting here for a little bit. Um, I'll be here. I'm looking forward to learning a lot about this as well. And me too. As a matter of fact, I've, I've gotten some great Q&A over the past couple of them, and, and I've worked these into some of this presentation and others, and I learn stuff all the time. So yeah, keep those cards and teaching. Yeah, keep yeah. those cards and letters coming. So uh, the first thing I want to mention here is uh, this presentation is not sanctioned by Garmin. I've not been in contact with anybody at Garmin. They don't ask me to do this. I don't ask them if I can do this. It just goes. I, I happen to have one in my airplane. I'm very pleased with it. It works really well. And I've, I've learned a few tricks over the years. And that's what I like to share with here. So I'm going to start with a couple of Zoom tips. Um, first thing, I'm working with the Garmin simulator. I'll be sharing that screen. You'll be seeing it in just a moment. And it'll really help. You can see a lot more detail if you maximize your screen. So in order to do that, uh, just there, on a PC, just there's a little box in the upper right corner. Just click that and make it bigger. Uh, the next thing, I've gotten some complaints with the chat. Sometimes can be a little bit noisy. I really don't want to discourage you folks from chatting amongst yourselves. There's great conversation that happens in there. But uh, if you're on an iPad in particular, I've found that whenever anybody chats something, it pops up and interrupts with a little box. So if you silence those chats, tap in that upper right corner with that more, uh, tap on the chat in the menu that pops up, and then that little bell there is going to be colored blue. If it's colored blue, that means you're going to get an alert every time somebody posts a chat. If you don't want to do that, then just tap on that and it'll mute those notifications and they won't be there to bother you for the rest of the chat. So uh, that's a great way to do it. Uh, we mentioned that, and I will mention here that we will be recording and we are recording this presentation tonight. I've got a YouTube channel that I've been putting all the old stuff, the old, uh, previous programs on. So if you want to go back and watch things with the pause button or the rewind or the fast forward or, or the mute, <laughs> it works great, uh, then uh, go to my YouTube channel. There's the link. Uh, Brian will be posting that in the chat uh, here so you can copy it off uh, your computer there. When you're viewing that, those videos, if you like them, that helps other people share the, find them more easily, if they, especially if they do a search for GNS or Garmin or Navigator or something like that. This helps them find stuff. And even more importantly, if you want to get a notification when future content is uploaded, then subscribe to that channel and you'll get a notification. So it keeps you in the loop here a little bit. And you may notice here from this catalog here, I've got an extra section, I called it. The, the last presentation, we had a little technical glitch there. The hatch just blew and we lost a couple of minutes. So I recorded an extra section that uh, included those extra minutes and it also had a little bonus on there. So. 
if you're curious about what we lost on that flight plan catalog in the last presentation, then it's on this extra section. Go find that and uh, you'll, you'll get tuned in. Uh, the next thing is if you'd like to book an individual session, a half hour session to start with, go to this community aviation website and there's several uh, expert instructors from across the country on a range of subject matter. You can uh, book sessions with me or any of those other experts on whatever subject you, you want to learn about. Uh, Rich Stoll, Gary Shank, uh, Larry Jarkey are some of the instructors on there and there's a host more. Uh, so go to that page for more information on that. Uh, Brian has been hosting a website on his, a page on his website about this particular series. So there's the link for it. Uh, if you start out there, we put a link to all the recordings on that page. We put a link to the Garmin simulator on that page uh, and some other reference documents, some pilot operating handbooks and quick reference books and that sort of thing. Uh, there are links to all these documents online. So it's a great place to go for all those resources. And uh, last but not least here, actually penultimate here, not quite last, uh, the Ventura County 99s are, uh, this is their Zoom account that we're using. So my, uh, my thanks go to the VC99s for hosting uh, this uh, particular series on there. Brian and I have both been speaking as a part of their uh, pilot proficiency series every year for a number of years now. And that they have loaned us this channel to do this Zoom uh, webinar on. And so thanks to them. Go visit their site. The VC99s are amazing group of women doing a lot of great things in aviation. You can go check out their whole website and learn about that group. And the last thing we'll put in here, uh, actually, uh, this is a link to the Garmin simulator. This is the sim simulator that I use for these presentations. Um, Earlier, we in one of the first or the second episode, we posted a, a bad link, or it was a good link, but to an older version of the simulator that needed Windows 7 to run on. This is the most modern simulator on this link. Uh, this one works on my Windows 10, which is the setup that I'm running here. It will not run on a Mac. So if you have a Mac, I actually just got an email today from a gentleman who says he's had some luck running the simulator on a virtual machine window on his Mac. So maybe you can have a little bit of luck with that. But this simulator uh, is 14 years old. Uh, you can see the as of November 13, 2007 here, it's ancient. Um, I don't expect they're going to update this. The navigation database is also ancient. It's 14 years old. So there's a lot of approaches that are in the system now that are not in uh, the, the nav database uh, that's available in the in this uh, simulator. So you have to kind of, it's learn, more about learning techniques than learning current navigation with it. Uh, and last thing is if you like that music during the pregame show, this comes from the AOPA Top 100 Aviation Playlist. Uh, my friend David Tulis helped cobble this together. Uh, Jill Tallman uh, is the name on this account that uploaded it. He wrote an article about it several months ago in AOPA and uh, he said I can borrow his music. So there's his music. All right, and I did see one question pop up there about should we use the Q&A or the chat? And the way Brian and I have found this works best for us is that we use the Q&A for questions for uh, Brian or me and uh, use the chat for general chatter amongst yourselves. Uh, we found it's just virtually impossible to keep up with the amount of traffic on that chat line. It's all good stuff and we do look at it afterwards. So We'll, we'll pick up some information out of that that we can roll into future programs. But if you've got a question specifically about the, uh, the Garmin 430, 530, the, the techniques that I'll be teaching tonight, uh, please use the Q&A for that. And if we don't get to something in there, again, uh, Brian and I will go through that after the presentation. We'll make notes and, and start putting together our, our next episodes here. So, Brian, have you ever had to do a holding pattern in, in actual battle? I've done uh, a number of holding patterns <laughs> in actual battle, and uh, uh, it's always been kind of fun. And sometimes they sneak up on you at the last minute, and you're like, oh, wow, okay, uh, I needed to be prepared for this ahead of time. Uh, they, they usually happen when you least expect it. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I was giving an IPC the other day and realized that we need to do a holding pattern. And how do I do this on a Garmin 430? Is it the student had a 435 30 set up and so i just did the approach we activated the miss and uh, it comes with a holding pattern on it so we just did that one but i'm sure there's a lot more that you can tell us 
There, there's a lot more to it, yeah. Uh, this picture I'm sharing right now is the last time I got a holding pattern in battle. This was in my 787. Uh, about a month ago now, going into Dallas, there was weather in the area. And he gave us a holding pattern that was at a fix that was not on the route that we had in our database, uh, in our flight plan. So first we had to find the fix. And it, it turned out it was another transition on the arrival. So the database knew about it. Uh, but he cleared us to hold west of the fix. And the published holding pattern is to the south, like you can see here in, in th this picture. So more, more pandemonium trying to get this all situated. But the point I want to get to is these things can happen all the time. I, I've gotten one holding pattern in actual battle in my 182 on the way into Las Vegas. It was a day just like today. It was clear skies, great visibility, beautiful day. And they wanted me to hold for an hour for traffic going into McCarran. So I, I think that was long ago enough. It was, I couldn't even use my 530 for it. But um, yeah, uh, you get them anytime and we need to be prepared for it. And I've seen some chatter online recently, people saying, well, uh, just ask for vectors. You could do that. But if you're an instrument pilot, you really need to know how to hold. You need to know how to use your navigation device to execute that hold. So I really suggest that you figure this out. And so tonight we're going to go with the assumption that you know what a holding pattern is. You understand the basics of a holding pattern. We're just going to focus in on how to fly it with the, the Garmin GNS. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about entry procedures for, for holds. I'm not going to talk about um, minutes or miles to a large extent. Um, we're not going to talk about procedures, the reporting that's required or what you should be doing. That's for a different lesson. This is this tonight is just about using the navigator to navigate them. Um, so I'm going to break this up into three different kinds of holding patterns. The first one is procedure holds. And this is what Brian was talking about, that here's a holding pattern that's a part of an instrument approach procedure in the navigation database. Uh, and sometimes they're before the, the, the approach, the final approach segment, sometimes they're after. It could be either, it could be both in some cases. Um, and so that's a published one and that's pretty easy to do, but I'll, I'll walk you through one and we can talk about a lot of basics along the way. The next one I want to talk about is a, an, what I call an arbitrary hold. This is the point at some waypoint that's not part of a procedure. Uh, like that hold that they gave me the other day it was just a point in space. Uh, and so we had to make one up as we went along. And I'll show you how to do that with the 430 and the 530. You can't really do this. Uh, so you have to manually do it. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is, is what I will call a cheated hold. And this came directly out of a question that a gentleman asked me after the last presentation. And I'll give you the example that he proposed to me and asked if this was a legitimate way to fly it. So uh, let, let's get to that here in a, just a little bit. So to start with, let's look at these uh, procedure holds. And this is what I call a 200 level uh, capability. This is a holding pattern that's built into a standard instrument approach procedure, an SAIP. Uh, you'll see them on your chart They're, Like I said before, there's sometimes it's before the final approach segment. Sometimes it's after as the missed approach hold point. Sometimes it's both. So uh, it's a published hold. When you get one of these holds, you can't modify it. If you wanted to change the leg length or the direction, um, a left or right turn, you can't do that. You have to take what's programmed in the box. There is no way to manually modify it. If you're one of the lucky ones and you have an autopilot and you have GPS steering installed in your airplane, this is the creme de la creme. This is why you bought your 530. Your autopilot using GPSS will fly this entry procedure. It'll fly the hold all day long until you run out of gas if you let it. Uh, it's just beautiful, it makes it super easy. Or you can fly it manually. And uh, so today for this example, now, what I'm going to talk about here, I'll be using the, the Chino, California, KCNO. I'll be using the RNAV GPS runway 26 right approach. Uh, this is a procedure that, as you can see, has a holding pattern both before the final approach segment and another one out here at the uh, missed approach hold point. So we get one of each, and we're going to load this up and execute it from Paradise. Uh, this is a transition segment from Paradise. Takes you to CASB for the, the initial approach fix. You do the hold and lua procedure turn. We're actually going to do two turns in this hold uh, just to show you how the, the, uh, how the navigator reacts entering before, during, and after this hold. Uh, and then we'll go, we'll go ahead and do that approach probably at a higher speed just to see what happens. 
and then we'll uh, we'll move on to the rest of the business here. So uh, let me share my navigator. Here's, here's my uh, GPS simulator. And again, this is that simulator that I downloaded. I gave you that link just a little bit ago and it's in all the resources on Brian's website. And what we're gonna do here is um, we're gonna load this approach up. I'm just gonna do it the easy way here. I push the procedure button. I'm gonna select the approach, press enter. It happens to be at Chino already. Uh, so we press enter. I don't wanna do that ILS 26 right. I wanna do the RNAV 26 right. And uh, for this one, I want to do it with the Paradise Transition. That's the one we just saw on that chart a moment ago. And so it's gonna show you this approach. And one more thing I wanna point out here, if you're using this for instrument approaches, notice in the lower right corner here, it gives you this box and it says LPV. That tells me that the GPS is going to give me LPV uh, minimums. It's expecting to be able to give me LPV minimums on this approach. So you can use that LPV line of minimums on the chart. That's mostly gonna be for a future episode on instrument approach procedures. That'll probably be the next one we do. So you just look at this little thumbnail and yeah, that looks pretty good. We got all the fixes we expect to have in there and we're gonna activate this. This is a case where it's okay to activate it because it's the only thing in the flight plan uh, and this is exactly what we want to do. We want to abandon everything else we've, we're doing and we want to get on this approach. We want to fly to the selected initial transition and away we go. So you activate it. It takes you to the active flight plan page, flight plan page one. And you notice right here, it says it's going to navigate us directly to Paradise. It'll go to CASB. It'll do the hold. Then it'll go to Linden and Dewey as the final approach fix and so on. So if we press the flight plan button, it takes us back to the nav page two, the default nav page. And if we zoom out a little bit here, you'll see uh, that, that that's exactly what it's gonna do. Our present position directly to paradise. Let me give it a little bit of speed here. We'll start moving. Uh, I'm at 4,000 feet and I'm in nav mode. So the autopilot is going to follow this nav. And I prefer most of the time to use nav page one for this. So you can see my desired track is 109. I'm gonna spin my course pointer over here to 109 and that'll be giving me legitimate guidance on the, uh, the HSI. If we zoom out just a little bit, you, know, you can see we're gonna to go to paradise and we're gonna to go to, um, we're gonna go on to the, the uh, final approach, uh, the initial approach fix. I see that question there. How can you tell the difference between a transition and a feeder out on the approach plate? The short answer is the transition will have a skinny line that moves on. It has a course and a distance on it and a minimum altitude on it. The, uh, the initial uh, segment will have a little bit of a thicker line. Also, when you pull it up out of the navigator, as you saw, it won't say IAF by it. Uh, IA, that's initial approach fix. Uh, it just says nothing. So that means it's a transition uh, segment. So we're uh, navigating along here. We're gonna go directly to Paradise. Let me go ahead and pick up the pace a little bit more. And um, so a couple more things I wanna point out about this is, um, let's see, where's my notes here? Um, I mentioned that the only uh, holding patterns that the navigator knows about are those that are part of instrument approach procedures. You might see a hold published on a star or a SID and the, the Garmin that these 530 navigators, a 430, 530 do not know how to do any holds that are on a SID or a star. They only know the ones that are on instrument approach procedures. So a little bit of a nuisance, uh, you have to do it the, the hard way. Um, and so with this first little portion here, I'm gonna use the simulator with the GPSS steering, though you can't see it here when we're in nav mode on this particular navigation simulation, it's using a GPSS mode. So that means the GPS is gonna give steering instructions to the autopilot and we can fly it in the, in the autopilot's nav mode uh, and it'll fly everything just great. If you don't have GPSS in your airplane, then this will work differently and you need to understand fully how your autopilot integrates with the GPS. And that's beyond the scope of tonight. I just wanna point out that's different. I did get one question saying that, hey, you know, I try to, I don't have GPSS in my airplane and I try to use the nav mode of the autopilot and it goes crazy. It goes all sorts of every direction. I'm gonna show you why that happens in just a moment. 
So now we're uh, passing Paradise. You see it did that little dashed line turn anticipation thing. Uh, and it started the turn a little early. Our new desired track is 054. So we want to line the course pointer up with 054 as we fly this transition. We got eight minutes, uh, sorry, eight miles. It's going to take three minutes to get there. I'll go ahead and pick up the pace a little bit more. Um, and we're going to watch a couple of things here. In particular, as I'm coming into the hold, I'm watching this time and the, the time down here, the ETE, and I'm watching the distance until I get to that fix. Uh, I will, I got a moment here and I will chime in that if you want to slow down for the hold, you are you can slow down whatever speed you want when you're within three minutes of the fix. If you're more than three minutes from the fix and you want to slow down, just tell ATC that you want to do that. The whole point of a holding pattern is to waste time. So why hurry up and get into the holding pattern? You might as well just slow down. If you slow down enough, maybe you won't have to hold at all or, or minimize your time in the hold. So uh, I don't have a way conveniently to switch between uh, the, the chart and the procedure and the navigator, but you can see we're motoring along here. I still got about a minute and a half. I'll go ahead and bump the speed up a little more. Uh, just Mike, until we get we within a, a pull up this approach plate on our iPads ourselves. Which plate is it? This is the Chino uh, RNAV GPS runway 26 right approach. Okay, thanks. So if you want to look at the, the Jeppesen or the government chart, it doesn't matter. They're, they're both essentially the same. So we're within a minute. Now I'm going to slow back down uh, from ludicrous speed down to just kind of normal speed to sports speed if you're a, a Tesla driver. And you can see as we slow down, notice this holding pattern is getting smaller. It's constantly calculating the size of that turn as we're approaching based on our current ground speed. So now, uh, once the speed stabilizes, the size of this holding pattern will, will stay the same. Um, so as you're getting ready to go into the hold, keep in mind yeah, we're, we're here to waste time. Uh, so there's no sense rushing through this holding pattern. Um, while you're in the holding pattern, you think about why you're in this holding pattern. Are you, are you holding for weather? Are you holding for a disabled aircraft on your runway? Are you holding to burn down fuel? Why are you doing it? Can you be preparing for the next thing that you need to do? It looks like I slowed down a little bit too much here. I'll pick it back up again. So you got this time. You need to build your situational awareness about what's going on around you, why you're here, and why you might need to leave, and what your options are. And think most importantly about how long you can stay in this hole. How much fuel do you have and where do you need to go? How much fuel is it going to take you to get to where you, your, your plan B is going to be if you can't make plan A? So now we're, we're closing in on this thing. We've got a mile to go, about 25 seconds at my 150 knots. Notice it says hold teardrop. It says that right up inside of 30 seconds from the fix. And it is calculating now what kind of entry procedure it's going to do. So if you're looking at this procedure, you might note that it's a four mile hold. It's not a one minute hold. It's a four mile hold, which is kind of interesting. We're seeing more and more of the distance holds than we're seeing the time holds. But it tells me what heading it wants me to fly, 059, and it counts down. So you might as well just follow this along and put your heading bug on 059. Worst comes to worst here. That's, that's where you need to go. Now, the next thing I want to point out is now it says the desired track is 256. That's the inbound course. That's not the course we're flying right now. Right now we're tracking 059. So this is the inbound course line, the, the home leg of the, of the um, hold, if you will. So if I set my course deviation pointer here to my, my course pointer to 256, now this course deviation indicator is going to show me my deviation off of this line. This is why it doesn't work to use nav mode in your autopilot because the, the, on the outbound case here, it happens to work, but you'll see as we get around the corner here, your autopilot, if it's in a, a true nav mode, is gonna to try to intercept that. So it's gonna intercept this outbound course, uh, your, the reciprocal of your inbound, which is not what you want. You need to fly this course out there to give yourself room for this teardrop entry. Um, Judy asks if it's an, on an instrument approach with a procedure hold, you're in it because it's usually required, right? It, it, the, the hold or the hold in lieu of procedure turn is required unless the procedure says no PT on that particular segment. 
that's why I picked the paradise transition on this and not the homeland transition. If you look at that plate, the homeland transition says no PT on it. So you can proceed inbound and you don't have to do the hold. So if you're on a vector to the fix uh, for the hold, then yes, you will have to do it. Most cases you'll have to do it unless it says not to. Um, what are your recommendations if you're stacked over CASB and there's several other aircraft ahead of you? Uh, this is a great thing and we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but what I want to mention is if you're in a hold and you're waiting for weather or a disabled aircraft and there's aircraft above you and aircraft below you, part of that situational awareness is who else is in this hold? Who, who's above me and who's below me? Uh, my friend Gary Shank tells a story of, of being at 7,000 feet in a hold one time and he heard another airplane in the same hold who was above him at 8,000 feet got a clearance to descend down to seven. And Gary thinks, oh, wait a minute, I'm at seven. Why is somebody else being cleared to seven? So he keyed up and asked approach control, hey, uh, I'm at 7,000. Did you want that guy to come down to seven? So this is part of, of what's going on, that situational awareness, where can you go and who else is here with you? As far as the changes needed to stay in the hold, what I wanna point out right now, it's a great question. You're, you're, I'll get to that in just a second. Notice now, as we do this turn inbound, this deviation bar on my HSI, it's starting to come into the middle, but it's still showing me where that hold leg is. So that's a handy thing to know when you're flying out here. If you're already through it, you're on the wrong side of that hold and you should never be there with this GPS navigator doing it for you. It, it's just great. So the way this navigator is set up at the moment is once we get to the holding fix, once we arrive at CASB this next time, we're going to proceed inbound on the approach. And if that's what you want to do, just great. And uh, you would call ATC at about this point and you're, you'll say established inbound. And they'll say, okay, you're cleared for the approach and away you go. Uh, now on this inbound leg, we got two minutes to go and I'm going to go ahead and pick up the pace just a little bit. I'll give it 150 knots. If you want to stay in that holding pattern or instead of proceeding in on the approach, push the OBS button. Now you see the suspend here, and that means the navigator is going to suspend waypoint sequencing and you'll stay in the hold. So we'll see this again. Uh, we got about a minute and change. I'm gonna go ahead and speed up a lot here to, to ludicrous speed. We're at 4,000 feet. Our max holding speed is 210, but I'm gonna break the law and I'm gonna go to 237 knots here just to make it go faster. This will have a little effect that you'll see in a moment. Uh, that our turn radius at 237 knots is going to be bigger. It's going to redraw this holding pattern uh, for the bigger speed. But as long as this says suspend, you will stay in this holding pattern until you run out of fuel. So make sure that's what you want to do. And I suggest every time you're coming inbound to the fix here, you should just check that and make sure whether it says suspend or not. If it says not, then you're going to proceed inbound and make sure that's what you want to do. Okay, so we got some more. Yeah, so the question is, will the 430 sequence you the next leg of the approach on the first turn inbound? As you saw here, it, it won't, it, or it will. It will sequence you into the approach unless you press suspend and you see suspend enunciated right here. So as we've crossed the fix now, we're proceeding outbound. It's doing another turn in a holding pattern. Uh, Judy, yes, you do push the OBS button to get that suspend enunciated. And you'll see here inbound on this time around, once I get established outbound, I'm going to pick up the speed again and we'll unsuspend it. So we'll proceed inbound on this approach. I just wanted to show you that this is what you need to do if you want to remain in the pattern versus exiting the pattern. You have to take an action on this hold. I'm gonna show you another one a little bit later that works a bit differently. Uh, my desktop sim, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. There's a couple of cases, I think, for instance, you'll see later on after this approach, we're going to do a, a missed approach hold from this uh, procedure. And on the missed approach hold, it stays in the hold. The default is to remain in the hold. And I think the reason for that is that there's no fix after that. So if you were to sequence after that missed approach point, uh, it doesn't know where you want to go. So it's easier for it to calculate just on staying in the, uh, in the pattern. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think it's because you've acted the approach late. I don't think it's a quirk of the simulator uh, that uh, An Anonymous here is using the X-Plane simulator. I haven't played enough with that simulator to know, but I I'm going to pick up the pace here again to, to get to the end of this hold. 
So the key thing is no matter what it's doing, make sure it's doing what you want it to do. If you want it to stay in the holding pattern, make sure it's, it stays suspend. If you want to exit the pattern and proceed inbound on the approach, then make sure it it's, doesn't say suspend. And that's what we're going to do this time. I'll go ahead and turn it off now. Uh, now we're rocketing outbound here down to this fix. So I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'll slow down a little bit just as we get into the turn so we don't end up over Lake Matthews in this turn <laughs> going too fast. Um, okay, question from Brian. If you got GPSS, doesn't the autopilot need to be in heading mode instead of nav mode? Yes. Uh, the GPSS basically hijacks the heading mode of your autopilot. Uh, and again, this comes into um, make sure you know this the way your system works. This system with this simulator uses nav mode to simulate the GPSS mode. In your airplane, most autopilots I'm aware of, the s and the Garmin's and so forth, you need to be in heading mode and it will, the GPSS takes over the heading bug. It ignores the heading bug on your HSI and will do what the GPS is telling it to do. Uh, flying uh, Mark asks that when you're flying the Holden Lou of procedure to a distance, no shortcuts. Yes, in fact, I meant to point out here, you will notice just as we got to that turn point, the distance pointer back to the, uh, back to the fix said four miles. So you want to go all the way to that four miles, no shortcuts, that's what's cleared. Now the reality is you could probably ask ATC if you wanted to do something different, if you wanted to do a one minute hold or a 10 mile hold or whatever, what have you. If it's not an, a terrain issue, if you're not going to run into anything, they'll clear you for whatever you'd like to do. So it's a good way to shorten things out. Uh, Andy asks, what if you decide to divert out of the hold? I'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, why did the holding pattern go lopsided? It's because when I was approaching the, the holding waypoint last time, I was really fast. Remember, I, I was about 250 knots coming into it. So it calculated that turn based on that higher speed, and I got a, a, a very big radius. I didn't slow down quickly enough. Um, how do you remove the suspend feature so it continues? You just push the OBS button. You push the OBS button to suspend sequencing. You push it again to resume sequencing. Uh, the suspend button or the OBS button has a lot of different uses. You're going to see another use in a little bit as we come out of the next hold after this one. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, does it compensate for wind? Richard asks if it compensates for wind. Remember the navigator is calculating a ground track. So it's going to do whatever it needs to do to make that ground track. So yes, in a sense, it does correct for wind. Uh, one difficulty might be, though, if you've got a big, let's say we're, we're coming outbound on this turn right here, and we have a big wind out of the south, even wrapped up at a standard rate turn or even a little bit more, it might not be able to track this line exactly because you've got a big ground speed on that outbound turn. So it'll basically re-intercept this outbound leg once you get there. Uh, let's see, Edward's got an STEC 50 on GPSS is heading mode, seems to hunt left and right a lot in the hold loop. Um, you know, if it's doing a lot of hunting, it could be something as simple as your aileron cable tensions are incorrect, or there could be a gain setting in the autopilot that's not just right. My experience has been, at least most of the time in a relatively calm wind situation, it's going to track it really well. So, okay, well, I will pick up the speed now since we're on this approach and uh, I'm going to stay at altitude here. You're going to watch what happens as we, so we're approaching the fix, suspend is turned off, so we're going to proceed inbound. Right now, it, it looks like it's going to go outbound, but you're going to see here it says next track 257 and, and it's counting down. So that means it's going to proceed inbound. It's going to go past Casby on the way in. And when this happens now, the next fix that becomes active is, uh, is Linden. Okay, and that's still not the final approach fix. I'm going to rock it down here. We'll go on to the next one. But uh, if you're looking at the approach procedure, we can descend at this point down to the minimum altitude at Linden. That's okay. I'm not going to do that for now since th this uh, program tonight is not about how to execute instrument approach procedures. It's about how to do holding. So I'm just going to rocket through this part of the, the next approach. But I do want to show you as we approach the, the missed approach point, the sequencing thing. I, I've shown this in every program so far, and I always get questions on 
sequencing the missed approach uh, after you've gotten to the missed approach point. So uh, we'll look at that. Let's see, uh, the, the Stev 3100, I think you mean the, it used to be the S-Tech, now it's the Genesis 3100, uses nav mode for GPSS steering. So I, I, this highlights exactly, yeah, Charles, thanks very much for posting that. This highlights exactly what I was mentioning a moment ago, the, the importance that you understand how your system works. How does your heading bug and your autopilot mode work with your GPS? And that, that's really important that you understand that. So if you don't, you got to get out your books. You got to look at your GPSS book. You got to look at your Garmin Navigator book. You got to look at your SDEC Autopilot book. Figure out how everything works together. And when you can draw a block diagram of how all these connections are made, you'll fully understand what's happening. Okay, now we're approaching Linden, and a Dewey is about to become the active waypoint. This is the final approach fix, and you'll see when it becomes active, we're going to change into approach mode. Right now we're in terminal mode. So now we're in LPV mode. Uh, and of course, the GPS is telling us we're on course and we're high, of course, because we're at 4,000 feet instead of the, I think it's 3,100 on this segment. Uh, but again, I'm not flying the approach. I just want to show you what happens. So it's giving us a, a, an odometer countdown to the fix. It's giving us the time to the fix. So I always like to keep this in my scan and think, okay, I got 22 seconds to lose 2,000 feet. Uh, that means I got to lose 6,000 feet a minute to make that. I'm not going to make it. I need another turn in the hold to, to lose this altitude. So uh, crossing to final approach fix. And again, I'm gonna get into this more on another program on flying instrument approach procedures. Over this fix, I do that time turn twist throttle talk a checklist. I also add two more tires. Make sure your gear is down and green. Your landing checklist is complete. And the last one I add is think, what kind of approach am I doing? What kind of navigation is it giving me? Do I see the correct navigation? Is my correct navigation mode enunciated here and down here on my HSI or on my OBS? And what's the decision altitude or minimum descent height, uh, minimum descent altitude that I'm descending to? I always like to walk through that at the final approach fix and uh, before I get all the way down. So the next thing's gonna happen in about 30 seconds here, we're gonna get to our missed approach point, which is the runway. Of course, our missed approach point is an altitude on an LPV, so we're going to look for the, the uh, missed approach altitude. I forget what it is off the top of my head. I do so many approaches around here, I don't, uh, I don't commit them to memory. But as we approach this, I'm going to slow down a little bit because I want to show you what happens when we get to the missed approach point. This is another case where the, the, GT, uh, the GNS navigators switch into suspend mode. So watch right over here, you're gonna see suspend automatically enunciate here and it's gonna suspend on that missed approach point. You got three seconds and I'm gonna talk you through this. Now suspend and notice this little carrot is over here on the left. So now the navigator is trying to navigate us back to the missed approach point. It's doing that because it assumes we're circling. And if you are in the middle of a circling maneuver back to the airport and you end up having to go missed, yeah, that missed approach starts at the missed approach point, so it's showing you where that is. If you want to navigate the missed approach procedure instead of circling, you have to turn suspend off again by pressing that OBS button, and you'll see we come out of that approach mode. We go into missed approach mode. This is one of the few times you'll see it. Uh, you'll normally see the missed approach mode enunciated on an RNAV approach, but not on an ILS or a localizer or something else. So now the navigator is navigating us directly to Iruyi, and I'm going to go ahead and pick up the pace here again. We'll be climbing out. Once everything's under control, we're going to call uh, approach control again, tell him, hey, we're on the mist out of Chino. He's going to say, say intentions. So it'd be a good idea to have something in mind about what your intentions are. Do you want to go back and do that approach again? Do you want to do another approach at that airport? Do you want to do an approach at another airport? Do you want vectors to visual? Whatever it is, have that in mind so you're ready to answer that question. Uh, it's like a gums, load tune. Yeah, there's all sorts of mnemonics for uh, for checklist procedures. I learned TT doc the first time and I my second instructor taught me TT, TT, T, and I've added more T's. And uh, so that's one of the things I'll do. If we go fly together on an IPC, I'll walk you through mine. But I, I want you to do something at least at the final approach fix to make sure, confirm that your navigator is doing what you expected to do and taking you to where you want to go. 
So we've sequenced to the next waypoint now. Our next fix is Lahab. This is our missed approach hold point. It's 10 miles away. It's going to take us two and a half minutes. So we can take a, a couple more questions here. Uh, Jim McGee, can you quickly mention difference between bold holding pattern and dashed on the missed approach? Yeah, the, the dashed one is the missed approach hold if you're looking at the approach played on a government chart. The solid one is a, a hold before the approach. And then you can look at something like Corona where it's the same holding pattern for both. That's part of why I picked this one is it, it's a different, there's two different holding patterns. Uh, this one's gonna have a, a direct entry you'll see in just a minute. You'll see how nicely this will navigate that uh, direct entry. But so a dashed holding is, is a missed approach hold. A solid one is a before the approach hold. Uh, for non-WAS, heading mode is the only way, right? Um, if you've got a non-WAS, a TSO-129 navigator, that'll fly this too. It's about GPSS that will uh, fly this for you. Uh, the holding patterns don't depend on WAS or non-WAS. The approach type does. If you've got a non-WAS GPS, you won't get LPV, you won't get LP plus V, uh, you won't get LNAV, VNAV, a couple others. Okay, so we're rocketing out to this holding pattern. Uh, this one, again, you're going to see uh, track 241. Oh, yeah, TR241. That means a track of 241. We got 242 here. That's pretty close. Uh, that was Richard's question. Uh, okay, let me slow down as we're approaching this a little bit. Phil asks, are there conditions that would prevent GNS from activating the first leg of the mist when you press suspend? None that I'm aware of. It, it will... I'd have to double check that. Um, I'm gonna make a note of that question, Phil, and get back to you on that. I'm not aware of any. It normally assumes that you will sequence into the missed approach hold when you press suspend after the approach. Uh, okay, what are the times that are displaying if we're doing a time hold? This, I believe this holding pattern is a time hold. Uh, let me just double check that. Uh, no, this holding pattern again is a four mile hold. Um, and then the, the last hold we're gonna do coming out of this hold, in fact, I'm not gonna do this whole hold. I just want you to see what happens here. Um, I'm gonna show you the indications and how we're gonna do that. We'll see how time goes. If you wanna stick around, we've got some extra questions we wanna, hand, wanna deal with, then we can do that. Okay, TR means track. Where are you being guided after the missed approach point if you don't hit OBS? Looked like it was just headed straight to the missed approach anyway. Um, it, the, this autopilot is basically gonna track out, uh, straight outbound uh, on this autopilot. So notice again here, just for a moment, it says hold direct. It's giving me the outbound turn. So we've seen a teardrop entry. We've seen a direct entry. It gives us the countdown to the time. It's going to lead that turn a little bit. It's starting the turn out to 076. Our desired track on this one is 256. That's what we have here. It was the same as the other one, wasn't it? What a coincidence. So notice here to the left of our navigation indication, uh, this is uh, what we're navigating from, how we're doing it, and to. We're holding at Lahab, and this gives us a distance. If you're on a timed hold, it gives you a, a time figure in here. And when you're outbound from the holding waypoint, on you, especially on your entry, it, it shows you how many seconds you've been outbound so it knows when to do the turn inbound. Uh, Bill says uh, he was told there are no timed holds in RNAV approaches. I'm not willing to make that as an every statement. I think most of them now are distances, but certainly the GPS navigators are capable of doing a timed hold as opposed to a distance hold. Um, so never say never. Um, yeah, alternate missed instructions make it fun uh, from Chris. Yes, if you get an alternate missed approach instruction, then you're on your own. You're going to have to do the next thing I'm going to show you, which is the arbitrary hold. So let's go on to that. Let me just see. Uh, where are you being guided after the miss? Oh, so um, Michael's question here. Um, if you remember now, we had this carrot that pointed, that's the bearing pointer, it points to the active waypoint. And when we were in the missed approach, uh, or after the missed approach before we had sequenced it, the fix it was navigating to was the missed approach point, runway 26, uh, right? And this carrot points you toward it. Uh, the autopilot in this installation just continues going straight. It doesn't turn back. So 
it depends on your situation, what the airplane, what the autopilot's gonna do, but the navigator is showing you the shortest turn back to your hold waypoint. I think that's a kind of important point. I think just the way I'm understanding it, if you have such an installation that the auto in your autopilot and coupled up to it, that the airplane may start turning at that point. It may. So this is something wow. you're going to have to figure out what happens with your installation. Got it. Important safety tip. Yes. Your mileage may vary. Uh, slippery when wet. Um, okay. Regular procedure, uh, if you're given missed approach to an alternate, we're gonna to get to that in just a second. Can it be entered in advance? I don't believe so. About the best you can do is to enter the alternate fix after the procedure. So let's look at that. We'll pull up the flight plan here and you see it says we're in this hold. Uh, also, it automatically went into suspend mode. So uh, I, I put us in a heading mode. So we're, we're tracking out here to the east right now. The best way I found to do this is to come down here in the flight plan and start twisting in your other, your alternate fix. So uh, for instance, I'm going to build a, a an arbitrary hold at the Seal Beach VOR. So I'm just going to type this in as a waypoint. We'll press enter. That's the VOR in the southwestern U.S. Uh, yep, that's it. So now after our hold, we've got Seal Beach. If we look at the map here, we might have to zoom out a little bit to see it. Uh, let me see, maybe I can see it better on nav page two. Yeah, so here's the Seal Beach fix and it's after the hold. So let's say we wanna go there. How do we do that? We come up here to our flight plan. We give ourselves a cursor. We scroll down here to the fix and we just press direct. We wanna go direct that waypoint. Yep, uh, and then we make sure we're in nav mode in this installation. GPSS is on, whatever you're doing. In this uh, navigator, this is how we do this. So we're gonna go to hold, and let's say, uh, I'm gonna switch back over to, um, yeah, back to my presentation here for a minute, and we'll talk briefly about arbitrary holds. So this is a 300 level activity. And an arbitrary hold is a holding pattern that happens anywhere else that's not part of a procedure. So uh, you can't build one of these. You can't build a holding pattern in the flight plan database uh, so that your autopilot will automatically fly. You're gonna have to manually fly this thing. Uh, generally, you're gonna do it in with a heading mode, um, but I'm gonna show you in just a moment, we could probably get away in, in some cases with using a little bit of nav mode, uh, but you gotta fly the entry also which this is the part where you've got to figure out, you got to know what kind of entry procedure you're going to do. And uh, by and large, you have to use the autopilot in heading mode, not any kind of nav mode. So in this situation we're in right now, let's say air traffic control says, hold south of Seal Beach. So by default, that means one minute legs, that means left turns, that means your present altitude. And of course he would issue you and expect for the clearance time as well. So here's what that's, the first thing is let's build a picture of what it's gonna look like. This is our, our low altitude uh, in route chart for the Los Angeles area. Seal Beach, we're gonna hold south. So our inbound leg is gonna be south of the VOR heading north. Remember that. Uh, sorry, my, my drawing on a computer is horrible. I hope you can fly this holding pattern better than I can drive it. But that's essentially what it's going to look like. And the only leg we really care about is this inbound leg. So um, let's check back in on our simulator and see where we are. Um, okay, we've got about, uh, we've got a few miles to go. Let me pick up the pace a little bit. We've got a message light flashing at us. Let's see what it's talking about here. Set course to 236. Okay, we can do that. So now uh, we've got another um, three minutes and change, four minutes to get to it. So let's go back to our holding pattern here. Uh, this is what our holding pattern is gonna look like. And so here's the process. And here's where you might wanna break out your camera and take a screenshot or whatever. You're gonna go direct to the fix. That's what we're doing now. When you get to that fix, we're gonna switch the autopilot to heading mode and we're gonna fly the outbound heading. So the outbound heading will be determined by what kind of a procedure we're gonna do, uh, what, what kind of an entry we're gonna do. Um, hey, Mike. And we'll look at that in just a minute. We're going to monitor the distance and timing information so that we have some idea how, how much longer we have to worry about. When we get to the fix, 
um, we're going to press the OBS button. So this here's another use for this OBS button. In this case, not only will it suspend waypoint sequencing, but it's also going to allow us to set the course pointer on the HSI to represent the inbound leg. So then we're going to turn to the, the inbound or the intercept heading after the appropriate time or distance has elapsed. And here's the case where once we've gone inbound and we're on this, <clears throat> this intercept, um, more than halfway through that inbound turn, you might get away with selecting nav mode on your autopilot and let it track that uh, inbound point. And then once you intercept it, you set the heading bug to the inbound course. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So how are we doing? Go back to our simulator. And I still got about two minutes. I'll pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, default for holds is right turns. I think, yep, you're right. I get the dope of the day. I thought that through three, three times and I still guessed it wrong. Um, so, hey, um, there, you got some attaboys there. You got a couple get out of jail free cards. Uh, you can delete all those ones. Um, yeah, I'm working. Work. Yeah, how do you use the Jeppesen database file to update the simulator? That one is, is uh, for another discussion. Um, how can you know if you activate the approach? I cannot remember what I did, what display or where. So you never need to push the activate approach button. If you are sequencing waypoints normally inbound on the approach, the approach will become active. And the way you know this is that when the, the uh, final approach fix becomes the active waypoint, the navigator will switch into the approach mode. It'll be the reverse video, the white letters on a green black background. Um, yes, and uh, Jerome, we, we can assume some of us don't have an autopilot. I have one. It, it's actually barely better than a doorstop and maybe a, a high-priced paperweight. It doesn't do much at all. So I can't manually fly this simulator, so I'm using the, the autopilot in this simulator. But yes, you'll have to manually fly this with your yoke if you don't have an autopilot. Uh, and uh, Bruce asking about my TTTTT mnemonic. Uh, seven T's is my full-blown version. Time, turn, twist, throttle, tires, talk, think. Is that seven? I, I lost count. So time, start your clock for a timed approach. Turn your aircraft to the inbound uh, heading. Twist the OBS knob to the final approach course. Uh, time, turn, twist, throttle. Once you're established, reduce throttle, start your descent. Tires, make sure you got down and green. Your landing checklist is complete. Talk, report final approach fix inbound to the, the control tower and think, what kind of approach am I doing? Okay, here, hang on, hold that thought. I'm gonna set my heading bug to the outbound heading and I'm gonna to switch to heading mode. Okay, now I'm gonna press OBS and I'm going to set my course to the inbound leg of the holding pattern is 360. I'll tell you what, we will do a, a parallel entry here. It was supposed to be right turn, so ignore that picture and just imagine it was a right turn. We're doing a parallel entry on this. Now, uh, and I would normally be slowing down, of course, back to my non-ludicrous speed. Watch your time and route. This is your time from your current position directly to the, the waypoint, which is the holding fix. And my time is all screwed up because I messed with this turn. When that gets to a minute, that's a good time to go ahead and start your, oops, not that one, this one. We're going to start our left turn, and I just start this turn 90 degrees. That's all you need to do for now. If you turn it 180, and let's say you've got a wind, so you have to turn it more than 180 degrees, some autopilots will start the turn in the right direction, and if you turn it too quick, the autopilot will turn back around the other way. So I always like to start that turn with a 90 degrees heading change, and then refine it once we uh, go past the other side. And now you'll notice here we're- You don't get an, uh, a picture of the holding pattern. No, you won't get a holding pattern. There's no way to build that pattern in the, uh, in the navigator. So okay. th on this entry leg, I'm gonna have to cheat this a little bit because I, I forgot to slow down before I got to the fix. So I'm gonna let it go past this to do a right pattern um, parallel entry. I'm gonna wait just until this needle is, is goes to full scale and then we'll turn it inbound. Now keep an eye, this is a time when that bearing pointer becomes really important. That little green bearing pointer, it's going through about 341 right now. Okay, once I get to full scale displacement, I'll take my heading and I'll start the rest of the turn. And I'm gonna turn that heading bug so it goes just a little bit past that bearing to the station pointer. 
that assures that I'm going to intercept the inbound course before the fix. If I have the heading bug set over here somewhere, I'll roll out before I'm gonna to get to the station and I will never get to my inbound leg. So I'm gonna kind of keep an eye on this and keep that heading bug pointed just a little bit past where the bearing pointer to the station is. And you can also see the bearing pointer on the 530 on this expanded scale mode on nav page one. On the 430, you don't have that feature. So you have to kind of wing it a little bit. So I'm gonna increase my turn just a little bit. And now you'll see that this heading will intercept that inbound leg before I get to the, the holding fix. Not very much before, but this is a, a parallel entry. This is the most complex one. And I have to remember, I'm doing a right turn after this. Okay, so here's the case where we could push the nav mode now and let the autopilot fly this intercept on the inbound leg. Uh, how do you bring up the bearing to station? On the 530, that's always there. Ross, that, that uh, bearing pointer, that's a natural feature of the 530. Uh, some of the electronic HSIs will have this, a standard uh, physical mechanical HSI will not have that but I believe the G5s have it, the, the new GI-275s have it. That's what I'm looking for, for for my airplane pretty soon, I think. Okay, so we're only half a mile from the fix, 15 seconds, it's intercepting that. I'm gonna set my heading bug now to a 90 degree turn to the right. And when it gets to that arriving at waypoint, I'm gonna switch to heading mode. So this is, now I'm established in the holding pattern. I've done the entry. Now I'm just flying this procedure. Uh, does the 430 have that option? No, Ross, that uh, bearing pointer does not exist on the 430. It only exists on the 530 on this nav page one. If we go to nav page two, you don't have it. And this nav page two is the same as you've got on the 430. But, uh, oh, sorry, I meant to zoom in on that a little bit. So, sorry, 430s don't have that one. Should have bought a 530. <laughs> uh, why wait for full deflection? I was just waiting for full deflection on that one, Martin, because I was going too fast when I entered. I didn't slow down. It was poor planning on my part. Um, so eh, where are we now? Okay, my heading. I didn't actually want to roll out on that 90. I, I meant to keep the, uh, the bearing, the heading coming over to the uh, to south, my outbound heading. And now on this outbound leg, we're going to watch this time. Right now it says we got a minute to go. To, if we were gonna fly directly from where we are to the fix, but we're not gonna turn right now. We wanna continue southbound on this heading for a little bit. And this will constantly give us our time to the fix. Up at the top, it gives us our distance. So if you're manually doing one of these distance type holds, then you're gonna wanna wait for this distance pointer to get to whatever the prescribed distance is for the pattern or whatever ATC cleared you to do. And just so to we're doing a timed, also on the clearance, you said hold south, but technically, because people are chatting about this, south on the 180 radial, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Which means our course pointer is set on 360. And that's what con confuses, has confused pilots for 100 years. Right. So the, the direction when they give you for a holding pattern is where that radial is going to be in relation to the fix. It'll be south, north, Correct. east, northeast, wherever. But you need an inbound course on top of that. Right, and if they just say south, then that implies the 180 radial. If they say west, that means the 270 radial. So I would um, probably clear that up with them if they gave it. If you got a question, yeah. absolutely ask the question. Right. Uh, track display versus north display. Uh, Tim, I covered that in the first couple episodes. I like uh, track display for exactly this reason. It builds me the picture a lot better about what's going on. Uh, I accidentally flew a little bit south on, uh, a little bit east on that hold, so I'm going to have to cheat this one a little bit too. Um, but we'll take this hold, and again, I'm going to turn it to the right now to an intercept heading just outside of where my bearing pointer is. My bearing pointer is here about 342 or so, and, and it's moving. You can see the needle coming alive. So again, we can push nav mode, and uh, here we are at one hour already, and I'm only halfway through. <laughs> the rest of it goes fast. So this is the only way I know of doing a, 
an arbitrary hold is somewhere you didn't want to have to hold. So can you set an inbound course to a fix in the flight plan? Yes, this inbound course trick works anywhere. You can do it off a user-defined waypoint. You can do it off a, a fix in your flight plan. You can do it off some random point somewhere that you make up. <laughs> yeah, Michael Storm, I love your comment there. Fly the airplane. Yeah, it turns out that's the, the best thing to do. Uh, and how can you know if you activate the approach? Okay, that one we talked about. And I'm, I'm gonna address this activating the approach probably in the next uh, program. I'm gonna do more of a deep dive on approach procedures. Uh, use navigation card for your 530. I found one on, on Craigslist, I think. One of my partners found one. It's a good idea to have a backup card. Yeah, I think we paid about 80 or $90. We've had it for about five years. I uh, have to wait to start time at two or from flag indication at outbound leg. Yes, if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty, once you get the, the two from change on the outbound, that's where you would start your time. I'm kind of cheating a little bit by using this en route thing here. Uh, sorting out the instructions on the programming from the instructions related to the autopilot. Absolutely. This is where you got to spend some time and understand your system. Okay, so let me go back to actually, let me uh, first. Close that. I'm going to reduce the speed down to zero because I'm going to switch gears now back uh, back to this. Um, um, it, so here's my checklist for the hold entry, how to find the hold entry. And if you take a picture of that and then go back and watch the replay uh, and I play through this in order, it'll make a little bit more sense. And then we go on to once you're in the hold, approaching the fix at the heading, heading bug to about 90 degrees in the right direction. Passing the fix, select the heading mode. This will get your autopilot to turn. As you turn, move the bug to the outbound heading. Monitor your time and distance so that you know when it's time to turn inbound. Begin your inbound turn. As you turn, set the bug to the intercept heading just outside that little green carrot that bearing to the, the station pointer. And then you can select nav mode on the inbound and then lather, rinse, repeat. That's how you fly a holding pattern. And of course, while you're doing the pattern, you're gonna, when you get established on the inbound, um, you need to be sure that you um, watch your timing, make sure that your timing inbound is, is what it's supposed to be or your distance. And if it's not, then you have to manually make those adjustments on the next pattern to try to get it precise. Uh, how to delete a hold if, your next, if it's your next active waypoint? Um, if it's a hold before the approach, you can just, push suspend or push the OBS button so that suspend goes away and it will cycle, cycle through to the next one. If in the case of that missed approach hold point, if, if you wanna just delete that hold, just put another fix after that and start navigating to that. <laughs> and Judy, sorry, you're, you're still confused. Give me a call sometime uh, and I'll, I'll help you sort that out. And Judy's got a gorgeous, really old 182 that I had the privilege to fly a few years ago. It's just a beautiful machine. And it's got a 430 in it. So uh, not bad for a 56 182. Okay, what happens if you forget to change in a heading mode? You use nav, nav mode to fly to the holding fix. Uh, that's not a problem. You just need to remember to change to heading mode when you get to the fix and you're going to go outbound. Uh, oh, sorry, Judy, it was a 1958 182. I should know that. Um, okay, Risk Man, do you have any more? You can produce the previous two slides for those without an AP. Uh, so in other words, make a version of that without, basically you're doing all these same things. You're just flying a heading or you're tracking that course once you're on the inbound leg. It, it's really quite that, that simple. Okay, so uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is cheated holds. Now, what if you're told to hold as published, there is no published hold and ask them what, what that published hold is. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I ended up with that 787 going into Dallas last month. Um, it, it, and maybe it's not published on the chart you're looking at, but it's published on some other chart. And this is where it's confusing. Air traffic control knows all these charts and we know the one we're looking at. So uh, if you ever have a question, just ask ATC. All right, so let me switch into this is a 400 level skill and we're going over. I was afraid this is gonna happen, but this is a fun one. Uh, this came directly out of a question that was asked by a, a listener from the last episode. And this is where it's a little bit like what Brian was talking about. We're gonna borrow a hold that's a part of another procedure to execute the one we want to execute. And the example that this, this pilot gave me, uh, let me see, did I write that? I don't have my notes in here about who this was. I wanna say, um, Denny S proposed this. He flies out of Gunnison, Colorado, and there's an obstacle departure procedure at uh, Gunnison. 
And uh, basically it ends up with a climb in the Blue Mesa holding pattern, hold southwest left turns 031 degree radial inbound uh, to depart Blue Mesa at or above the MEA or the MCA for the right of flight. Phew. And uh, this is uh, in the mountains. So you've got cumulo granite, all quadrants. So you've got an airport that's down in the valley. You have to climb above all that, this, this, these obstacles before you can proceed inbound, especially this time of year. It's starting to get kind of warm out there. You might have to do some turns in this hold. Uh, the problem is that you can't build a holding pattern just anywhere. Uh, it's a nuisance. You can do it like what I just showed you with that arbitrary hold, uh, but it's a lot of work. You could forget about the GPS and you could just use your VOR to do it. That's certainly legitimate. But he asked about this procedure and I looked at it and I think it's a brilliant solution to the problem. So let's take a look at it. Here's the low altitude chart. Here's the Gunnison Airport. So basically you're gonna come off the runway. In his case, he was departing to the Northeast. So up in this direction. And the ODP was a, a turn to the, you climb to an altitude, you turn to the right, to come direct to the VOR, and then you hold southeast left turns on a 031 radial. Look at that, 031 is the opposite of 211. So that's our charted hold. But again, we can't build, we can't summon this charted hold out of the nav database. So we have to play a little fast and loose with it. So watch this now. I think this is genius. He happened to notice that he was looking at the ILS approach and the missed approach hold for this procedure is at the Blue Mesa VOR left turns on the 031 degree radial inbound. So voila, he's got the, the uh, holding pattern available in the database. So let's see if we can cheat with this and, uh, and use that one. So you go into your flight plan, you put your departure airport in there and you select procedure. And I'm gonna walk you through this just a little bit. You'll, you'll select procedure, select the ILS approach. You can go ahead and activate it. We're not gonna fly this whole thing. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how to kind of skip forward a couple of beats here. Um, and it's got this hold at 031 over Blue Mesa, beautiful. So when you load that up in the database, this is what it looks like. So when you take off, don't fly this pink line right to the station. Remember the procedure was straight out to climb to an altitude and then make a right turn. So you're gonna be coming at it from kind of over here somewhere. So let's look at what at how this works. So here's back to our simulator and uh, I will initialize the position. I'm gonna put it over, uh, what was that airport, PUC? P this is the tedious part. And yeah, it's a, it, in the airplane, it's a, it was a PUC or was it PUB? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it was GUC. Gunnison, Colorado. So we go to Gunnison. How many times do you push the wrong airport in there? I've done that so much. So we're gonna reset our position to Gunnison. We'll zoom back down here. We'll push the procedure button. We're going to select uh, approach because this procedure was on the instrument approach. We, it was on the ILS. Uh, the transition, it doesn't matter because we're not gonna fly the, the early parts of this procedure, we're gonna fly the later parts of the procedure. So in this case, this is one of the few times when I'm gonna say it's okay to use vectors to final. And uh, it only gives us the activate, so it's gonna delete everything else. Uh, GPS guides monitoring only, it's because it's an ILS approach. Well, we're not gonna do the ILS approach portion of it. Um, how did we get here now? I think I did something wrong. What did I do wrong, Brian? Apologize, I was not paying attention. I was answering other what? questions. <laughs> You're supposed to hang on my every word. I normally do, Mike, you know that. I do, uh, yes. Okay, so we're gonna activate the ILS runway six, vectors to final, activate that. Okay, yes, yeah, so I got off the off base there somewhere. This is what I wanted to see. So we got the ILS approach runway six. Right now it's guiding us to the final approach fix. That's not what we wanna do. Uh, but we're gonna just check the map here and make sure this is what we wanna see. So we got the airport and we got our holding pattern. So that looks legit. All right. So 
Uh, we take off, let me put it on a reasonable heading here. I think the runway is 05 or something. So heading mode, and we'll start flying this. And it starts moving, it starts turning. Okay. So we get to our 9,500 feet or whatever it was on the procedure. And we start our southbound turn direct to the VOR, which is gonna be over here somewhere. Now we're gonna come back to the flight plan, give ourselves a cursor, scroll down here to Blue Mesa, and we wanna go direct to that fix. So is that the right fix, Blue Mesa? Yeah, we're gonna activate that. Now we got our pink line to the VOR. Now we can go to nav mode and the GPS is, is gonna fly us there. And it says it's gonna fly us there on a 222 course. So let's set our course pointer to 222 and we'll set our heading pointer there too. Now, if you look back at the flight plan here, it's got Blue Mesa and it's got a hold. Wonderful. So now, once we're there, we can go ahead and scroll down here and type in our next fix after that. So let's say we're gonna fly, if you're following along on the chart here, Let's say we're gonna fly Victor 95 out to Gorgi intersection, Gorge, however you say that. Uh, G O R J E. So that's our next fix and we'll take care of the rest of it after we get there. That's 80 miles away, so we got lots of time. So let's come back here. Okay, we're inbound, we got three and a half minutes. So you get the idea. Now, the, a published hold is a published hold. It doesn't matter where you found that hold, if it was in a procedure, uh, an, an approach or a departure, what, uh, a missed, uh, whichever procedure, you're not even gonna do that, but it's holding southwest of Blue Mesa on the 031 in left turns. And this is a, a super convenient way to, to get on your way. Uh, Errol asks about what about a VCOA? That's a visual climb over airport. That's beyond the scope of this uh, discussion. Yeah, if you've got VF, VMC conditions everywhere and you can see the rocks, you can climb out visually up to altitude. No problem at all. Um, uh, Judy, yep, sorry, you got to leave. Uh, you can watch the replay. And uh, if your approach bypasses the published hold, can you suspend to enter the published hold? Yes. I think you can. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, if there's a published hold on there and you want to hold there, then it will do one turn in the hold. And you just, if you want to stay in the hold, then you just push the OBS button until suspend is in there. And when you're ready to go on your way, then you can push it again and suspend will disappear and you'll go on your merry way. Okay, so we're booking out down the airway here. We got 40 seconds. You're gonna watch this. It's gonna do the entry for us. What kind of entry do you think it's gonna do? Anybody wanna take a stab? You're just realizing, Brian, we forgot to run the, the, the polls. We can do that if you want. I say teardrop. Ah, <laughs> what was your first guess? How do you know that? You're so smart, genius. I read the smart box. Yeah, yeah, we could run a, a, one of uh, those polls. Start with that second poll. Uh, since this is just going to do a hold here, uh, will any of these screens show on the 430? Um, yes. On the 430, you don't have this particular nav page, but you'll have a page similar to this one. This is your nav page two. And that's essentially the same on the uh, 430 as, as the 530. On the 430, basically, you, you'll get just the bottom portion of the screen here. So look at that, we got a lot of private pilots. Uh, no, around half of us are instrument rated, that's good. A few, handful of commercials and ATPs. Uh, and GNS, oh, look at that, we got 4% got have never touched a, a Garmin GNS. Okay, we got most people again saying they're intermediate. Uh, well, 11% of us, about a tenth saying you're a master at it, awesome. Uh, I, I consider myself to be a master on it, but it still catches me by surprise every now and again. Uh, let's see, it's it's still racking up numbers there. I don't remember if I had this set, Brian, for them to see the results as they chug along, but... Oh, I don't think so. I think that <clears throat> we'll publish it. They're still coming in. So uh, Lee says, working on my CFI. Awesome. Good luck with that, Lee. You'll, you'll really enjoy that. It's 
probably the hardest ticket there is to get. It is, and that's when you truly start learning. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so here it's doing the inbound turn. So if we were manually flying this, this is when you would cycle the, the heading bug over there. You're gonna wanna set the course pointer to the desired track. And, and this is why it doesn't make any sense right now. You'd be flying away from it if you, if you wanted to intercept that. So, uh, but once you line your course pointer up with the inbound leg of the hold, now it makes sense. And you'll continue your climb and our altitude on this is, is way up high. Notice also now we're inbound and we've got suspend enunciated. So it's gonna stay in this hold while we climb. Okay, so a little over half of us are instrument rated. That's good, that's what I would expect. Holding patterns are, are for the instrument rated. And of course, by instrument rating, I mean, if, if you hold an ATP, you are by default also instrument rated. Okay, most, uh, almost three quarters of, a, of you consider yourselves to be intermediate, that's awesome. All I can do is go direct in a lot of different languages. Yeah. <laughs> I can go directo in Spanish, and that's about <laughs> it. Credit Alicia for that one. Uh, let's see. Wow. Half of you have never seen one of the earlier programs. So you got to go back to my YouTube channel and go find the earlier stuff. Uh, if I went fast on a lot of these things, it's because I, it was probably a technique that I covered in an earlier program. I didn't want to do a whole lot of duplication here. So... Yeah, we're coming inbound here and let's assume say that we're we, we made it up to our our cruising altitude if we do nothing the autopilot is going to stay in this holding pattern and that's and we know that because it says suspend right here so we've climbed up we want to continue on our way so you push the obs button and suspend goes away now it says here's our next course and we can double check that it's going to go from the hold over to gorge and there it's starting our turn so now that we've, we've done that procedure, we've gotten out of the airport, now we can go ahead and fill in the rest of the route here. We've got some time on this, this next segment. It's gonna take us half an hour to get there almost. And we can fill in the rest of the flight plan. All right, that is, I think, the extent of what I've got here to cover. So do we have any more questions that I can, uh, well, let's go ahead and, and do the next um, the next poll, how do you do that? You know how to do that, Brian, right? Yeah, I'm working on it. It's, uh... Okay. And let me... Poll one, is that the one? What navigator uh, yes. do you use? Here we go. Yeah, so this is the next poll. I was just curious if you have a navigator, uh, which one do you have? And um, I, I have been getting a few G1000 questions and those are cool. The G1000, I found if you can work a GNS, a 430 or a 530, then working the flight plan feature of the G1000 is pretty self-explanatory. There's a few more features in the later model G1000s. They can do holds, for instance, they can do arbitrary holds and some other things. Um, but you're, you're well on your way if you can work a 430 or 530. Uh, 480. Yeah, not very many of you out there. There's not very many of those left in the in the wild, it seems like, either. I, I've seen a, a handful or its predecessor, the CNX-80. Um, I'm not quite, I don't get that one. The 480 and I are not on speaking terms. Uh, the Avidyne uh, 440, 540, I've used those a fair amount. Uh, I, I've attended Gary Reeves' training program on the Avidyne uh, 440, 540. I can teach them, but I, I would say that I'm probably about 75% fluent with those guys. Uh, King, yeah, I've used a, a KNS 80 a couple of times, 89. I'm not real good with that. So A lot more 430s than 530s. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I would have ex expected to see more 530s, but, um, but yeah, the 430s are like, a little smaller, fits in, fits in more airplanes, I guess. Yeah, most of everybody here is one of the two, though, I would say, <laughs> which yeah. makes sense. Yep. Okay, uh, any screen show would be proper to enter this ILS 6 info into the flight plan, delete the waypoints prior to the ones we need. Yeah, you could do that. You could delete. You, actually, the way to do it is just activate the leg to Blue Mesa, and that'll take care of most of that for you. Uh, nice to have, how would you handle the buttonology loading your IFR clearance on the ground and overriding it? Uh, that's what I would do. I would just enter this and then put your clearance after that, or at least put the first couple of fixes after Blue Mesa. Um, usually when I'm on the ground on an IFR flight plan, I don't bother doing the whole flight plan. I just do the first couple of fixes because especially if you're flying a longer way, 
that's a lot of fixes. It can take a lot of time. Your engine's running and you want to get underway. And the reality is once you get underway, you'll have some time. Uh, another handy trick that I like is I've got a Flightstream 210 on my airplane. So I can enter the, the flight plan in my four flight and then tap a button and it shows up in my 530. And I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> I was interrupting. It was a lane change. <laughs> okay. Well, let me finish this thought then. Yeah. Uh, just last week, Four Flight came out with another update that adds the ability to build a holding pattern anywhere. It's a cool feature. You have to have the pro or above, the, the middle level subscription or above. Uh, and I played with it a little bit the other day. Uh, it's an amazing feature. Um, it's beyond the scope of this discussion tonight because I'm talking about the GNS navigators. And the bad news is you can't transfer that holding pattern from ForeFlight into the GNS 530. There's just no way to do it. So stand by for maybe for a future, um, a future revision again of ForeFlight, they'll make that work. But yeah, it, it's really cool. I was just noticing that we can't make everybody happy because <clears throat> some people said, well, because there's more 430 people, why don't you do the 430 simulator next time? And, you know, I think last time you did the 430 and people wanted the 530. Yeah. <laughs> so there's always going to be somebody that won't see what they want to see. So all you can do is back and forth. It's very true. And for this one, uh, because I went so in depth on a couple of things, I didn't want to keep switching back and forth. But you're right. Um, I think that in the uh, program number two, part two and part three, I did a little bit more switching back and forth. So um, in the next one, if, if we do uh, in, instrument approach procedures, I'll probably switch a little bit more and I'll, I'll alternate between a 430 and a 530. Well, I look forward to that. I learned a lot here just on the holding pattern stuff and learned a little bit about how I was doing my workarounds and, uh, uh, and how much that was uh, more I can do on top of that. So I appreciate that. And I look forward to seeing more on, on holding uh, or instrument approaches as well. I'm sure yep, I can they, learn more about the way I've been doing those. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Very much so. It's kind of a pain sometimes, especially if you're doing an IPC and you have to switch back and forth and do a whole bunch of different kinds of approaches. Uh, the 430, 530 don't do that very well. But uh, right. So I wanted to move on to the closing stuff here. I'm well over the time again. I was afraid that was going to happen. It, it usually does happen. Um, so a reminder here, my YouTube channel is right there. Brian has already posted that in the chat or you can find it. You, you'll get a link to it in the, um, the follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow. Um, at the very least, go to Brian's GNS 101 webpage and it has links to all these things in it. Uh, the next thing is if you want wings credits, let's talk about that briefly. Uh, if you don't want wings credits, then you don't need to do anything. But here's the website. Go to faasafety.gov. If you don't have an account, you should create one. It's free. And uh, if you don't want wings credits, there's nothing you have to do. Uh, you'll get them automatically for some of you. But you, know, you can see they'll show up down here in the wings credit timeline on your wings page. If you do want wings credits for this, then send an email to that email address. And Brian, if you wouldn't mind throwing that in the chat box there too, I, you I may just, have already. I just did, yeah. And if you include this, oops, sorry. If you include that uh, WP05 number in the, in the subject line or at least in the body of the email, then that helps me uh, grant the credit. Um, but if you're watching this live tonight on, on Friday night, you don't have to do anything. It's all automatic. This, this email is only if you're watching the recording later on. And uh, questions or comments, send them again to that email address. And if you like what you're seeing here and you want to encourage Brian and me to do some more of this and help defray the cost of this pretty expensive Zoom account he's got, uh, we wouldn't mind sending a couple of bucks our way. Empty the ashtray out of your car, your, your bridge toll money. Uh, there's my Zelle and my Venmo and, and a PayPal account. You can send it there. If you want to send a check, send me an email and I'll send you my address. Um, any other way, I've seen people use pop money or something like that and something else. It, it seems to get to us one way or the other. And we certainly appreciate that. We, we thank those of you who have contributed a, li a little bit in the past. They, they give us the motivation to keep doing this. And we've also been making, you know, extra donations with the excess that we get on that as well to, uh, for example, the 99s who've, you know, supported with this Zoom account as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, they paid good money for the account and we're, we're helping pay some of that off a little bit. So uh, thanks very much. That is the end of our, our uh, scheduled presentation here. We can hang around here a little bit more and um, uh, do some more for those who want, but the recording is going to stop right about here. And uh, thank you very much. We'll see you at the next one.